So here we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes. So I'm here to discuss uh, my first book. And my goal is not to tell you everything about the book. Uh, my goal rather is to uh, discuss some of the core themes and ideas that the book entail, and then to also uh, feature some of the interesting characters that uh, are uh, prevalent in it, and hopefully stir up your interest in, in reading the whole book, and also stir up some uh, interesting questions uh, for the end of our program. And, and also thanks, as, uh, as Heather noted, to uh, others who have uh, already submitted questions in advance. Uh, first of all, a little bit of personal background for how I came to this, this topic. And for that, uh, we have to, to rewind uh, back to the time when I was a graduate student at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, you know what I forgot to do that I should probably do is just make sure that, that people can hear me. Is that right? Okay, okay. All right, very good. Um, so anyhow, rewind about actually like 10 years um, when I was a graduate student at the University of New Hampshire, and I'm casting about agonizing uh, over what my dissertation topic ought to be. And in the process of that, I came across the fact that the U.S. Navy had dispatched over 12 global exploring expeditions between 1838 and 1860. Uh, and these voyages went everywhere. They went throughout the Pacific world. They went to Ottoman Palestine. Uh, they went uh, <clears throat> to the Arctic, to Antarctica, to uh, West Africa, all throughout Latin America. And they uh, intrigued me for a number of reasons. Um, for one, and, and probably the, the biggest overarching reason is that they seem to challenge so much of what I thought I knew about early American history. Uh, for one, they were global, uh, a global at a time when the conventional thinking, and I had been kind of raised to think of the United States as being isolationist, uh, as being more focused on westward expansion than expansion overseas. Um, and they seem to me to have the potential to shed some really interesting light on the global dimensions uh, of the age of, of manifest destiny. Uh, so that struck me as being pretty interesting. Uh, they're unfolding at exactly the same time that we associate to the conquest of the West, at least in the early 19th century, the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. These voyages are happening virtually the same time. So they were global, and that that's, that's intrigued me. Um, it seemed to go against what I thought I knew about early American history. Secondly, they were expensive. So the first one, and, and one of the biggest of these, uh, was the United States Exploring Expedition. And thank heavens, contemporaries called it the XX. So I don't have to say uh, the United States Exploring Expedition uh, each time or write it each time in the, in the book either. And I'll show, show you uh, here, if this will work, the next slide. Uh, this is a dolphin skull that was collected by the XX. Uh, and this is out the Smithsonian. And before or between, you see the, a couple numbers at the top and then the word porpoise. If you look closely, you actually see that phrase XX. Uh, so you'll hear that uh, throughout the presentation. The XX was the first of these. It was one of the biggest, as I mentioned. Um, and it cost close to a million dollars. And actually, there are additional expenses afterward for caring for these specimens, for doing the publications that came with it. Uh, but the voyage itself, at least according to contemporary government accounts, cost about a million dollars, which is a lot of money for the early 1800s for the federal government to be spending. So this um, means that when I was examining these, there's this narrative about the early U.S. Republic being, you know, having a small federal government that didn't want to spend a lot of money. And then suddenly they're spending quite a bit of money uh, towards these naval exploring expeditions. So that, that struck me as being uh, at odds with what I thought I knew. And then thirdly, the third reason is that they were so British. They seem so British. Uh, they seem to very be very consciously replicating the voyage of people like Captain James Cook or Sir John Franklin, I'll talk about later, uh, and other figures, including also some European, uh, continental European navigators, especially the, the French as well. Um, and this collectively intrigued me because once again, uh, Americans are supposed to be proud that they are not British, that they are not European, that they are exceptionalist, and yet they're engaging in precisely the kinds of activities that these European aristocratic navies are engaging in. Uh, so I found that to be awfully intriguing, particularly even politically, we see a lot of Anglophobia uh, being used in the rhetoric of the early Republic, and yet they're, they're doing this. Um, so I sensed that these voyages would allow me to contribute to the scholarship on U.S. and naval history, 
on the question of empire in the early U.S. Republic, on imperial politics. And then I was just personally really captivated and excited to, to learn more about them uh, myself. So I decided to make this my, my dissertation project, and I don't regret it at all. Um, and above all, what I really wanted to do was to understand what was driving this incredible burst of naval activity around the world in the early 19th century. Um, when I was thinking about situating this in terms of the scholarship of what others had, had written on it, there, there, was, there is some scholarship in this area. They tend to focus on one or two expeditions, expeditions not all of them, uh, especially the XX has is, is been focused on quite a bit. And generally, my sense was that uh, <clears throat> they wanted to get to sea as quickly as possible uh, in, some, in some capacity. Um, <clears throat> and so they were paying less attention to kind of the, the politics and the culture, cultural dimensions of, of sending these out. So initially, I really wanted to focus on that. And then when I turned to doing the book, I decided that actually what they're doing when they're abroad, when they're out at sea, that those, those things matter and they can tell us a lot about the nature of these expeditions. So I kind of expanded it that way. And then I added another chapter about what these naval explorers brought back. When they come back from these various diverse parts of the world, they bring back their stories and their artifacts and their specimens. And that's, that's an important part of the story as well. Uh, so it evolved over time, but, but initially I wanted to understand what was driving them. And I came up with an answer, which is why I have a book. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you that, that answer. And the answer seems simple enough at first glance, but then it gets more, more complicated. So I argue in the book that the, the push for U.S. naval exploration originated with uh, a sincere desire to use the Navy as a force for cultural diplomacy in regards to Europe. So U.S. officials relied on these naval voyages of discovery to lay claim to a kind of civilizational maturity and a, in a Western sense in European capitals, and especially by making contributions to a transnational, the, the transnational empire of science. So to contextualize this empire of science a little bit, uh, I'll provide a little bit of, of background and, and uh, much of this you're probably very familiar with, but European Asiatic powers have been sending out maritime exploring expeditions for centuries by the early 1800s. And before the enlightenment, many of these activities had largely been uh, pragmatic. They were quests for territorial and economic expansion, uh, religious monarchical glory, et cetera. And those things certainly continue after the enlightenment. But nonetheless, the scientific revolution does add a different dimension uh, and a very powerful cultural dimension to these kinds of voyages. So suddenly discovery uh, is no longer perceived as a royal, a national, or, or simply a religious achievement. Uh, but also a, a heroic contribution to Western civilization and the empire of science. And this empire of science is a transnational imperial space. It exists uh, beyond sort of nation states, but it's nonetheless uh, very much something that nation states can contribute to. And it could be appreciated, I, I argue, in a bunch of different forms. So the empire of science, you could learn about it uh, in the 19th century through attending a lecture, uh, through reading a publication um, or writing a publication. Uh, at universities, at museums, encountering artifacts, uh, technology, various methodologies. This empire of science is really quite diffuse and it's very, very um, diverse in its manifestations. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a competitive cultural space where nations, imperial nations, uh, can joust with each other for prestige, uh, and particularly through individuals and institutions. Uh, this is a very nationalistic period uh, where you really, people strongly identify uh, with their fellow subjects or fellow citizens. Um, in this context, the Royal Navy becomes one of the most active contributors to this empire of science in the 18th and 19th centuries. And of course, Captain Cook uh, helped establish this tradition in the late 18th century. And then the Lords of the, the British Admiralty strengthened it in the 19th. And a key figure in this regard is uh, Sir John Barrow, who was the second secretary of the British Admiralty. And Barrow, argued that the Royal Navy ought to expand on Cook's voyages through new exploring expeditions. And he believed that these missions would increase scientific knowledge and British uh, prestige, that they would train future generations of naval officers, they'd promote Britain's very realistic expansionist uh, pragmatic uh, aims, uh, and they'd also of course serve as a, a tool for bolstering Britannic pride. So as he I have a quotation here for you. As he asked to the preface of a one, uh, one particular narrative of an expedition up 
uh, the Niger River in 1816, and I quote, to what purpose indeed could a portion of our naval force be at any time, but more especially in a time of profound peace, more honorably or more usefully employed than in completing those minutiae and details of geographical and hydrographical science of which the ground outlines have been boldly and broadly sketched by Cook. Uh, and of course, this is a rhetorical question. He knows exactly uh, what the answer is. Yes, the Royal Navy should do this. And so accordingly, uh, under his leadership, the Admiralty Office dispatched dozens of exploring expeditions around the globe in the early 19th century, uh, from the quest for the Niger and the Sahara Desert to the nor Near East uh, and to the North Pole and beyond, uh, South America as well. Actually, a lot of the places that, that the U.S. Navy goes, in fact. Uh, and so the Royal Navy was uh, so active that it really becomes the predominant vehicle for the expansion of Western geographical knowledge until about 1850. And at, about 1850, uh, so much of the world's oceans and its coastlines and its major rivers had been thoroughly mapped by especially the Royal Navy, uh, that it was really only the dry continental interiors of places like Africa and Australia uh, that had that remained incognito to the Western world. So that's when you, you enter in uh, people like David Livingstone or Henry Morton Stanley in the 1850s, 60s, and, and 70s. So this Royal Navy context, I know you're like, you're thinking, what the heck, this is supposed to be a talk on the U.S. Navy. Um, but this Royal Navy context is really important because there were prominent U.S. citizens who admired Cook and admired Cook's successors and wanted the U.S. Navy uh, to engage in similar feats of scientific discovery and scientific uh, conquest. And so the folks that I focus on in this, in this book uh, are people who I call explorationists or supporters of U.S. naval exploration. And they tended to either be uh, middle-class or mid-ranking naval officers or government elites, uh, people like high-ranking diplomats, secretaries of state, secretary of the Navy, presidents uh, as well, uh, members of Congress, et cetera. And one of the things they had in common was that they were all honor hawks. They believed deeply in uh, honor at a, both an individual and national uh, level, and they, and they craved European recognition and, and esteem. And there's, this is an interesting element of the, the more recent scholarship, that we think of the early 19th century as being as nationalistic as we are today, uh, the early 19th century as being particularly bombastic, particularly nationalistic, particularly patriotic, uh, people who are, are very proud of the revolution uh, and uh, will not doff their hat to any sovereign. Uh, but nonetheless, um, beneath all of that apparent confidence, uh, recent scholars have, have shown that there's actually, and I've argued that there's, there's quite a bit of real insecurity that a lot of white U.S. citizens have in the early republic, especially in regards to uh, the great powers of Europe. And these are some of the, the titles that were really influential for me in framing this part of the argument of my book. Uh, Elijah Gould that you see there, he, he was my mentor at the University of New Hampshire, remains, remains my mentor. Um, and what this, this gets at is the fact that the American Revolution uh, had two goals after all. Uh, we think of the American Revolution as being you know, largely focused on home rule of political independence. Um, but the second was achieving equality of European empires. And Jefferson is actually quite explicit about this. Uh, so in the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson states that it was time for the fledgling nation, quote, to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. So note that separation, but also equality. Those are the two goals of the American Revolution. And clearly separation happened faster. Separation was achieved by force of arms um, much earlier, in part thanks to the French and of course to, to Washington and others. Um, but achieving parity of European powers was gonna be something that was gonna take much longer to do. Um, and to do that, the US had to become um, a kind of great power itself, one of the great powers of, of the Western world. And what I've, what I argue in the book is that great power in the 19th century had, had three basic attributes. First is what I call developmental strength. So they had to have strong economies, they had to have powerful militaries, they had to have both of those things. They had to have a robust uh, commercial system and a powerful navy and or army uh, there. Secondly, they had to have cultural sophistication. 
according to Western uh, European standards, including contributions to Western art and science, uh, literature, uh, manners, all of that as well. So that's the second one, this cultural civilization element. And then the third one is they actually need diplomatic recognition as a great power by the other great powers. And this last qualification came with the expectation of playing balance of power politics in Europe uh, and in the Mediterranean world. So US citizens were generally suspicious of large standing militaries, even navies. Um, they take a long time to found the, the US Naval Academy, for example, for that reason. Uh, and of course, they had little appetite for intervening directly in European affairs or Ottoman affairs. That, that was not something they were interested in. Um, many were also a lot more cost conscious than European powers. They valued government frugality. But what it became apparent to me is I was doing the research and sort of thinking through this, this problem is the fact that most white U.S. citizens appear to have wanted the respect that the great powers of Europe afforded to each other. So what they wanted is they wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Uh, they wanted European recognition as a great power without having to act on some of the chief requirements of great powerhood. So for explorationist uh, dispatch in the U.S. Navy on this career of global discovery seemed to be the ideal vehicle for achieving that parity uh, with European states, uh, largely because that was one of the more visible activities of the great powers in the public eye. Uh, and visible might seem like an odd word in this you know, pre-video, uh, pre-photography world, uh, but visible in the sense that uh, <clears throat> early Americans would very frequently read newspaper accounts of the various voyages of discovery that Europeans dispatched. They read them with great interest. They were reprinted. Uh, there were American publications of European narratives of discovery. Uh, those were among the top hits for people who wanted to learn about the rest of the world. So visible, literate, they knew about these expeditions and they wanted to, to partake in this. There, they tended to portray the empire of science as a kind of common treasury for all mankind. So the idea being that every Western nation and this is a, an exclusive club, every Western nation, uh, could deposit into this treasury of common knowledge. And they could earn the thanks of all the other account holders for this empire of science. But free riders were frowned upon. And one of the points of diffidence that we see in these early, early Republican uh, figures uh, is that they feel very keenly the fact that the U.S. has not contributed in their minds to this empire of science, and they're very embarrassed about that. Uh, and an early example of this line of thinking comes from the first pages of the book, uh, and that's uh, a letter that Commodore David Porter writes to President James Madison right after the War of 1812. Um, and this letter uh, that Porter picks up and writes is coming at a real high watermark for uh, the growth of early U.S. nationalism. The U.S. had survived another war uh, with the British Empire. Uh, it kind of ended on an up note with the Battle of New Orleans, you could say. And while the war exposed important social and political divisions in the country, the U.S. had nonetheless emerged from the conflict with a rising sense of patriotic pride and with clear advantages in terms of expansion westward into Indian country. And much of that patriotism was seaborne. And here we actually have a great image, one of my favorite images from the War of 1812 uh, era. Uh, this is a, a tableau of the Treaty of Ghent uh, here from the Library of Congress. And uh, what we see is the U.S. is portraying itself as a new Roman Empire. We have an image uh, of a Roman imperial triumph. Uh, in this case, we have sort of a masculine kind of vision of uh, what is traditionally the, the feminine form of Columbia. But we have kind of like a Montezuma uh, figure that you can see riding in the chariot there. Uh, we have uh, Minerva uh, on the left is laying out the, the terms for peace. Uh, Hercules is forcing Britannia to accept and stepping uh, there uh, on the, uh, the trident uh, representing the Royal Navy. And then on the obelisk there, we have lots of naval names, including porters uh, there. Um, so this is, uh, <clears throat> we have you know Perry, we have Bainbridge, we have uh, Stephen Decatur, we have, and, and Porter as well. So during the war, uh, Porter had participated in creating this kind of national narrative of the U.S. Uh, becoming a great military power, at least in the way that they like to think of themselves. So in, for his part, he had led a U.S. warship, the frigate Essex, into the Pacific Ocean, uh, ostensibly to protect the U.S. whale fishery in the Galapagos Islands and to strike at British whalers. 
And a particularly noteworthy moment comes when Porter uh, proclaims the annexation of the island of Nuka Hiva in the Marquesas in October, oh, sorry, November 1813. Uh, and President James Madison ignored this. But it, it's a, an interesting uh, moment that, that foreshadows where the US is going to head in the Pacific Ocean. So Porter was eventually defeated in a very bloody battle, naval battle outside Valparaiso, Chile. But by the end of the war, he was feeling emboldened. He felt that his country had proven itself militarily against Great Britain, and that now was the right time to lay claim uh, to another aspect of great powerhood, and especially the civilizational element. Um, and I should all, also note that he was bored, uh, but most likely. He's serving as one of three uh, representatives on the board of Navy commissioners in Washington, D.C., um, and he very clearly wants to get away from desk duty. He wants to get back uh, to the oceans. He wants to get back to the sea. So in October 1815, he writes a letter to President Madison, and he offers to lead a voyage of discovery into the Pacific Ocean, claiming that, and I quote, there are yet great extents of ocean that have never been traversed by ships and innumerable islands of which we only have traditionary accounts, end quote. He promised that there are, quote, nations on this globe not known to civilized man, end quote. And then he went on to recount the names of famous European navigators and then bemoaned that, quote, every nation has successively contributed in this way but us. We have profited by their labors. We have made no efforts of our own, end quote. And he presses this point again later on. Uh, quote, we have reaped all the advantages of the labors of other nations and gratitude and duty now call loudly on us to add to their store. We, sir, are a great and rising nation, Porter reminded Madison. It was time to put the United States, quote, on an eminence with others. So Porter, um, another interesting thing about this, this letter, by the way, is he actually suggests that this voyage should pry open uh, China and Japan, which is both kind of a follow-up to, to the British Lord McCartney's mission. He has a failed mission to China, to Qing China in 1793. And it's also, of course, a preview of uh, Commodore Perry's mission to Japan in the mid-1850s, which is my next project. So it's a really fascinating letter that I use to kind of open up uh, the book. And it gets at all of these, many of these early themes for this, this movement. Madison appears never to have replied to Porter, uh, kind of like his ignoring of Porter's uh, annexation of Nuka Hiva. Um, nothing ever came of this 1815 proposal, but it wasn't the last word on the subject. Otherwise, there'd be no, no book uh, if it was the last word. So the next prominent figure to pick up this explorationist banner that I write about uh, was another veteran of the War of 1812, which once again, I don't think that's a mistake. Uh, in this case, this was a man named John Cleve Sims. Uh, and Sims, this is a sketch of, of him from 1820 by, uh, by John uh, James Audubon actually met him and did, and did a sketch of him. So Sims had served with distinction in the War of 1812 in the Army and the Battle of Lundy's Lane in Fort Erie. Afterwards, he picked up a pretty lucrative position as an Indian trader on the Mississippi River. And uh, it's in that position that he starts reflecting on what he thinks to be the next steps for U.S. great power hood. And having helped the nation preserve its independence through force of arms, he believed that the U.S. could set its sights further than just home rule and independence. And particularly, he became infatuated with a theory uh, of his own making in large measure, that the earth was hollow, that inside the earth, there were other spherical worlds just like the earth, and that openings to these subterranean worlds, rich uh, subterranean worlds, existed at the poles, and you could enter into the earth through holes at the poles. Uh, if this is familiar at all or strikes a chord with you, uh, later on, Jules Verne uh, would actually uh, take his ideas and he spin them up into a pretty memorable story called Journey to the Center of the Earth in 1864. And that's inspired by Sems. So Sems in 1818 is so taken at this, this theory uh, that he abandoned his, his lucrative government post and he abandons his family. And he has 10 kids. So uh, that poor family uh, there, a poor, poor, uh, poor partner. And he embarks on this publicity campaign to try to get uh, him uh, up to the holes in the polls. Um, and as he urged in a newspaper editorial in 1823, and I quote, the nation is now at peace and every part is calm. Our resources are improving. Our citizens are generally enterprising and other nations 
evidently expect from us something signal. Shall we not now be roused to some noble enterprise, something that shall keep the national spirit awake, end quote. And note especially here the sense that Europe is watching uh, and that the establishment of peace and prosperity then opens up uh, the door for the U.S. to take the next step towards being a great power, that we should do something uh, with this peace and prosperity. Sims was a pretty captivating public speaker by all accounts, um, alongside passionate calls for exploration. He mixed his lectures with a pair of wooden globes that he had, hollow wooden globes. Uh, he had scientific tricks that he would do with magnets and iron filings, uh, et cetera. And he's also fairly politically savvy. He's sending memorials to Congress to support plans for a mission to the polls. He's getting people excited about them, having them write their own uh, memorials. He's publishing in newspapers, uh, you know, the equivalent of tweeting for today. He, he's really trying to make a push for this. Uh, nonetheless, he never got to embark on such a mission. Uh, he died in Ohio in 1829. And uh, very fittingly, his supporters put uh, a monument with a hollow globe over his, his grave. Uh, this one is actually the uh, version 2.0. This is the one that he that his son raised uh, later on. I think the first one was wooden, I believe. I could be wrong on that, but it, it nonetheless deteriorated such that there is a, a sense that there needed to be a second one. So Sims uh, certainly met with some ridicule uh, at times. And one of, the, uh, one of the funnest primary sources I came across was one where uh, <clears throat> there's apparently a common joke that if you couldn't find something in your house, maybe it had, had fallen down one of Sims's holes uh, there. So there, there was ridicule uh, regarding his, uh, his theories. Uh, but nonetheless, he, he stirred up considerable public interest. Uh, and he kept this explorationist cause alive. And in particular, what, what he did uh, was he inspired and mentored uh, the figure that's the central figure for the first chapter of the book. And that's a man named Jeremiah uh, Reynolds. Uh, Reynolds was born in Pennsylvania in 1799, but mostly raised in Ohio, which is where he met Sims. Uh, and he was bright, he was articulate, and he was highly ambitious. So as he later wrote a patron, quote, I am not great yet, but will be and glorious. And he underlines glorious uh, there. Uh, and later on, he'd say, give me latitude and I will strike bold for immortality. And once again, he underlines immortality. So he's somebody who has grand uh, aspirations. Uh, and unfortunately, we do not have a surviving portrait of Reynolds. Uh, it, it appears that he was, he's was he been painted several times. Um, maybe it's hanging up in some town hall uh, attic in Ohio, uh, but we haven't been able to locate it. Uh, nonetheless, so what I have for you to give a sense of, of him, therefore, uh, is his signature. And, and just look at the way that he signs his name in this letter. Uh, for those of you who looked at these you know, documents from the 18th, 19th centuries, you'll know that uh, they can be pretty florid in the way that they, they write with their handwriting. Uh, but this is like on a whole nother level, like all this underlining uh, under his, his name. He, he thinks he's going to be somebody uh, that we're all going to remember, uh, et cetera. Um, so Reynolds really saw knowledge as a way both for him to become immortal, uh, for him to become uh, a, a prophet for this explorationist cause, to, to realize this, uh, this um, promised land almost, in a sense. And he actually uses the, the term prophet for himself at one point. Uh, and he also uh, believed, you know, very fundamentally that, that knowledge was going to be a way that the U.S. would also make its mark in terms of this empire of science. So he sees a nice alignment between his sense of patriotism, what's required for the country, and also for himself. Um, Reynolds uh, had to work very, very hard to get the education that he did. Uh, his stepfather didn't really uh, appreciate book learning, a, a lot like Lincoln's father. Actually, I'd, I'd make some comparisons between Reynolds and Lincoln in the book. Um, both Midwesterners who loved Henry Clay there. Um, but by 1816, he had learned uh, enough to become a teacher himself. And uh, he, from a very early age, he, he states uh, in his writings that he had, quote, imbibed the relish for books of voyages and travels when I had not yet seen the ocean, uh, end quote. And he was especially taken with this man. This is Alexander von Humboldt, who was a, a Prussian baron who had tracked through South America between 1799 and 1803. And Humboldt uh, wrote um, prolifically after his return. He published all kinds of scientific volumes uh, that were hugely popular on both sides of the Atlantic. And as historians have been uncovering of late, uh, Humboldt was the great titan 
of Western science in the 19th century. It's not Darwin, uh, at least Darwin's later, but, but at least for the early and mid 19th century, it's really humble. And virtually all of the figures that I write about in the book are deeply inspired by, by Humboldt, including all these naval officers. They all want to be humble. And if you've ever uh, wondered, that's, that's partly why there are so many humble names in the West, if, you know, Humboldt, uh, Redwood, you know, State Park or, or Humboldt County or whatever. If you've done a road trip to the West, you'll, you'll note that Humboldt's everywhere. And that's because uh, John C. Fremont, a prominent U.S. Army explorer, also just idolized uh, Humboldt. So Humboldt uh, is a towering figure, not only in Europe, but also in the United States. Um, and uh, Reynolds uh, just completely uh, admired him and wanted to be, in some sense, the American Humboldt, uh, except in this naval, in this maritime uh, dimension. Um, and later on, he'd actually he'd voyage uh, and venture through South America and, and replicate uh, many of, of Humboldt's sort of exploits in South America. So Reynolds uh, not only admired this uh, aristocrat, this European German aristocrat of Humboldt, uh, but he also deeply admired, and he came to deeply admire, U.S. whalers and sealers. Uh, and increasingly in the early 19th century, these men had become private explorers uh, in a sense, as they pursued and slaughtered their prey across uh, the Pacific and the Antarctic Oceans. And, and Melville has some great quotations about that, uh, of them becoming uh, their own sort of small r Republican explorers, uh, the equivalent of Cooks uh, and of uh, Bougainvilles and others. So when Reynolds is uh, meeting these figures, and he starts doing these, these travels a lot like his mentor Sems had done. He takes up Sems's uh, role. He's traveling around New England. He's meeting these whalers and sealers. He's learning more about uh, the Pacific and the Southern Hemisphere through them. Uh, and he starts to conceive of the Southern Hemisphere uh, as really a as sort of a working class, masculine, or at least middle class, uh, masculine empire of knowledge in the, in the Pacific. And this allows him to really combine the more aristocratic European empire of science that Humboldt represents with uh, this more uh, democratic, republicanized knowledge that uh, these middle class and working class mariners are creating uh, through their their private commercial exploits. And so he thought that the Pacific through these mariners was quote, our field of fame. And the way he talks about the South Pacific is actually so, so incredibly uh, aligned with what we see from Herman Melville when he is later really elevating US whalers uh, and his writings, especially Moby Dick, but others as well. Uh, he's actually, and he's actually deeply inspired by, by Reynolds. And uh, Reynolds writes a, a very famous short story uh, <clears throat> about a white whale called Mocha Dick in 18, I think it was 1834 is when it's published. And you can guess where, where Melville got his idea from. So Reynolds, what he sought to do was take this uh, Europeanized genteel empire of science and translate it into an empire of knowledge. Uh, and he made uh, very, very passionate appeals that the U.S. should embark in a voyage of discovery to be able to shore up and lay claim to this, this empire of knowledge. Um, and here, uh, he is joined by none other than the president of the United States who, who comes to uh, sort of, sometimes Reynolds comes to him a little bit, but they come to an alignment. They form a very powerful alliance in the mid 1820s. So President John Quincy Adams uh, was among those who deeply admired Cook, who deeply admired Humboldt actually too, uh, who was a great lover of science and natural history. Uh, in many ways, he considered that to be his 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 main love, and he kind of wishes, he, he wished that he could have pursued that rather than, than politics, but his father made him do politics. Um, and he had spent enough time in Europe to develop a deep admiration for scientific voyages of discovery. He's often, uh, much of his early life, he is posted abroad as a diplomat. So while serving as a U.S. minister to St. Petersburg, for example, in 1816, uh, he meets with one of these uh, European explorationists, Admiral Adam Johann von Krusenstern, and Krusenstern uh, was uh, the captain of Russia's first circumnavigation of the world. And that's happening about the same time as the Lewis and Clark expedition, 1803 to 1806. Uh, this is a, an image here. We have the, the Russian uh, discovery ship, in this case, uh, in, uh, off uh, Kodiak Island, in fact. So Adams already was already on, on board with this uh, proposal. And so in his first annual message to Congress, he uh, lays out uh, a, an argument that revises, uh, re revives Porter's theme and, and Sims's theme that the U.S. was indebted to a European-dominated empire of science. So he's making this case, and he 
in this case, requests that the U.S. Navy send a, a ship to explore the mouth of the Columbia River and then to chart the whole northwest coast of, the, of um, North America. And what he's doing here uh, in this case is um, really a, cloaking his language in the, in the grander language uh, of the empire of science. And I'll, I'll quote here. And assuming her station among the civilized nations of the earth, the United States had an obligation to the improvement of those parts of knowledge which lie beyond the reach of individual acquisition. He portrayed in his address the, the voyages of European navies as, quote, heroic enterprises that have not only redounded to their glory, but to the improvement of human knowledge. And, and Adams is, is therefore picking up many of the major themes we've seen uh, from other early explorationists, including Porter and Sems, uh, and really believes that that this is an, an opportunity for the U.S. Navy to also uh, contribute to this larger transnational empire uh, of of science here. Uh, Adams was was incredibly passionate, but privately very pessimistic. He actually did not think uh, that uh, this voyage would would get off the ground in his lifetime, uh, and maybe not in his children's lifetime. In fact, uh, nonetheless, uh, the House of Representatives did end up passing a bill that provided fifty thousand dollars for the president to send a small warship, uh, in this case, to the South Pacific. They kind of shift from the Northwest coast that he calls for to the South Pacific, large because of, of the work that Reynolds was doing uh, in terms of lobbying and raising uh, interest about whalers and sealers. And so this bill does pass the House of Representatives in May of 1828, uh, but then the measure died in, in the Senate in the following uh, year. Um, nonetheless, before that happens, Reynolds, uh, is, um, is, is not pessimistic at all. Uh, Adams makes his proposal. He wants to get it on the agenda, get it in the minds of Americans. He's pessimistic about it. Uh, Reynolds sets out to make it a reality uh, here. So to back up a little bit, what Reynolds does is he gets Adams's blessing to be a kind of uh, administrative naval agent, uh, a proponent for this. And so um, he embarks, like his mentor had done, Sims, he embarks on a national publicity uh, campaign. He's barnstorming the Eastern states. He's offering incredibly stirring, uh, highly nationalistic public orations. He's lobbying state legislatures. He's collecting memorials from them to deliver to Congress. Uh, and he repeatedly uh, harps on the themes of both commercial development, but also the honor of, of discovery. Uh, and here's an, here's an example. February 1828, he says, quote, it is for our interest and our honor to be well acquainted with the capacities of the globe, to see what resources can be drawn from that great comet of nations, the ocean. And nonetheless, while he, he did talk about commercialism, it's really clear that he is a romantic whose, uh, quote, his soul is, quote, burning at the thought of uh, dispatching, and I quote here, the first American expedition of discovery and the first many Republican government of all time, past or present. Uh, so he really is mostly excited about this empire of knowledge uh, as opposed uh, to this empire of commerce here. Uh, he writes a letter to Adams and Secretary of the Navy, Samuel Southard, where he says, quote, we must gather laurels in the Pacific where others have partially failed. The result shall be useful and brilliant honorable to our common country uh, there. And I think that order is important, useful, but brilliant. Uh, they are honorable. Uh, and Reynolds's passion and education uh, paid off. The reason why there's that bill in May of 1828 that passes the House of Representatives uh, is largely due to him. Uh, nonetheless, in the Senate, as I mentioned earlier, the bill comes uh, to the Senate in 18, early 1829. And there, uh, here's Adams, uh, and there it meets opposition uh, from this man. This is Robert Young Hain, uh, who was the chair of the, the Senate Naval Affairs Committee, uh, and he was a South Carolinian senator. And Hain, um, previous historians have thought of him as being uh, partisan, uh, which in some sense, in some sense he is, to the extent that anyone in this period is, any politician in Washington. Uh, but really what, what I agree is that he was actually principled, and, and his, his principles were uh, that he... Uh, was very, very concerned about the escalating costs of exploring uh, the, the South Pacific and embarking on many of these, these expeditions. He basically says, 
uh, that the Pacific is so large that no one expedition could possibly chart it. So we're looking at many, many expeditions uh, that would be incredibly expensive, uh, that have to be paid for by either direct taxation, by tariffs, or by raising the price of public lands. Uh, and he he opposed, uh, you know, he and other South Carolinians, John C. Calhoun is his mentor. They oppose all three. They're, they're not interested in these expensive federal uh, government schemes. Um, and he was also concerned that uh, Reynolds represented a potential danger to the Republic in the sense that that once the U.S. embarks on these voyages of discovery, they might want to found colonies. Uh, and Reynolds just seems like precisely the kind of enthusiastic figure adventurer who'd want to do that uh, there. Um, so he thought that this, quote, spirit of adventure would coax the U.S. out of its uh, sort of isolationist policies, what he called uh, the wise and prudent maxims of previous presidents, especially Washington and also Monroe uh, as well. So peering into the future, what he saw is that if the, the U.S. embarked on this explorationist agenda, uh, he thought that the U.S. could could crumble through excessive taxation, foreign colonization, European wars uh, as well. And he um, feared that Reynolds's sort of empire of knowledge might end up resulting in a Europeanization uh, of the U.S. Uh, of, the, of the United States. So in February of 1829, he uh, therefore recommended that the Senate reject the measure, and it did. Um, there's a few attempts to revive the bill in the Senate, but they go nowhere. And so by the time that Andrew Jackson is inaugurated as president in March of 1829, naval exploration appeared dead, and Adams' pessimism appeared to be correct. So crestfallen, Reynolds actually embarks on, on his own private sealing voyage of discovery to South America. He ends up getting tired of them. He embarks uh, on his own sort of uh, continental adventures, climbing volcanoes and other things. He plants the flag, the U.S. flag, on top of a volcano at one point uh, in South America. And so what I argue in the first chapter is that he had tried to translate this Europeanized empire of science into a more smaller republicanized empire of knowledge. Uh, but nonetheless, that wasn't enough to win over skeptical Republicans like Hain of South Carolina. Uh, Reynolds and his allies would have to shift the emphasis from exploration as being an effort to win prestige in Europe, as being a, a venture for honor, uh, to making it um, pragmatic, to making it utilitarian, to appealing to the pocketbooks and the very real expansionist imperial interest of key parts of the white uh, body politic. And so ironically enough, uh, it ends up uh, being left to Adams's uh, bitter enemies, uh, Jacksonian Democrats, and here we have the head Jacksonian himself, to really carry forward uh, this, this uh, exploitationist cause. And so what I, what I argue in the second chapter uh, is that the XX, the United States Exploring Expedition, the first one of these in 1838, is really predominantly being sent out to uh, build an empire of commerce. It's, it, it does do contributions to an empire uh, of science, but nonetheless, the, the primary impetus for this, this expedition uh, is really to protect the American whaling industry, uh, the, the China trade to a certain extent, uh, and other uh, sort of working class mariners in the South Seas. Uh, historians have associated Jackson with democracy, but I think actually that Richard Hofstadter uh, is correct in terms of the essence of Jacksonianism was really capitalism, uh, and he's going to shore up American capitalism uh, in the South Pacific. And, and here, I'd refer you to uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Jason Smith's wonderful book, To Master the Boundless Sea, uh, which really I relied on uh, quite a bit. Uh, it was very informative uh, for this part of, of the book, that cartography is really important uh, for the XX there. Um, <clears throat> Let me, for time purpose, I want to make sure that we get we get time to that number. You have questions, so let me uh, fast forward a little bit here. Uh, here's the Vincennes uh, off Antarctica. Uh, that's the flagship of the the XX. There, um, these are some of the charts that they make. This is the chart of the Fiji group that they come back with. This is the real practical benefit. This is the commercial benefit uh, of sending the Navy overseas on this expedition. And what I argue. Uh, in the book is that the way that these voyages, this explorationist vision ends up triumphing is that even though it begins as an effort to get prestige and acclaim in Europe, 
it ends up uh, becoming a predominantly utilitarian or pragmatic imperial um, movement where different groups can use this imperial tool of naval exploration to fulfill their own particular needs. So for Jacksonian Democrats, it's this. Uh, let's have maps and charts that shore up American capitalism that create uh, sort of uh, an extension of the Jacksonian marketplace into the South Pacific. Uh, it, it also, and I'll, I'll fast forward here a little bit. These are images. They did bring back a lot of uh, <clears throat> natural history specimens. Here I am with a bunch of dead mammals in the Smithsonian. Uh, here I am with uh, some ethnographic artifacts. These are clubs from Fiji uh, that the XX collected. If I look giddy at all, I assure you it's a complete illusion in this photo. Um, so they do conduct science and they actually set up the very first uh, publicly funded museum of natural history uh, to house all these all these, these uh, artifacts and and scientific specimens that the XX brings back. Uh, but then uh, later on, um, they uh, end up having to expand their coalition by appealing to other uh, constituencies and other interests. So I'll fast forward here actually for a moment. Um, another one of these exhibitions that is incredibly intriguing is one to the Holy Land in the 1840s. Uh, by the U.S. Navy, was charting the Holy Land, they were charting the Dead Sea. And what I suggest in this case is that this is a way to bring U.S. evangelicals to buy into the explorationist cause. Uh, so American evangelicals, uh, above all, particularly conservative evangelicals, uh, they want to, to have proof that the Bible is literal truth. Uh, and one way to do that is to send a scientific exploring expedition to the Holy Land to, to prove that. So this is a scene uh, from that. And what they're hoping to prove in particular is the, the truth of this uh, painting by John Martin, a British painter, uh, showing the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, that the, that the Dead Sea is actually uh, the sunken remnants and flooded remnants of the valley of the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah uh, were, once, were once there. So the Navy goes to Ottoman Palestine uh, as an attempt to shore up uh, a Protestant empire, in essence, a U.S. Protestant empire. Um, the U.S. Navy, unfortunately, um, also explored vast portions of South America, uh, looking to expand slavery in the 1850s. Uh, maybe that will come up in, in the questions. I think I saw a question about that. Matthew Fontaine Maury uh, is the mastermind behind that. So here we have a slave market um, in New Orleans. There was a, a very conscious attempt to expand the slave south into South America in the 1850s through these voyages of discovery. So once again, here's a very practical utilitarian, horrific, um, but deeply held value for slaveholders and slavers to have is, hey, here's this tool of naval exploration. It can be useful for, for us uh, in terms of uh, a key part of our, our domestic uh, imperial interests. And then finally, the, the last chapter of the book uh, goes back to this theme of great power rapprochement. And in particular, it looks at uh, these U.S. Navy voyages of, of discovery uh, into the Arctic in the 1850s. And it, it gets back at, at this uh, attempt by the U.S. Navy um, and explorations in general to use these voyages uh, to lay claim to a kind of civilizational maturity and, and to get respect in European capitals. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what happens uh, in that because I'm hoping that uh, you will uh, read the book and, and enjoy the book. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that's kind of the architecture of the piece. And since this is uh, a book talk, I thought I'd end with one of the lines that I'm proudest of in the whole book, and that comes from that, that chapter. Um, <clears throat> so before the United States and Britain faced Germany in 1917 to 1919, and 1941 to 1945, or stood shoulder to shoulder against Stalin in the Cold War, they fought the Arctic. And that's the framing uh, for that last chapter is, is US-UK rapprochement. Um, I'm going to stop here to be able to give us uh, time for questions, but uh, hopefully that gives you a flavor for, for what the book is about and some of the big ideas of the book. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to add a spotlight to myself, and we're going to go through some of the questions. A couple have come in. Um, and I want you to go ahead and be able to address the questions that were submitted earlier. I don't know if you have a particular order that you would like to answer them, but maybe you want to start out with um, the question. 
why wouldn't antebellum U.S. naval expeditions be considered as enforcing the Monroe Doctrine when it came to the Western Hemisphere? It's a big, big question, but sure, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what I would say is that we we tend to see more invocations for manifest destiny as opposed to the Monroe Doctrine, and this is actually really kind of kind of interesting. Um, you know, the Monroe Doctrine is certainly notable and it's important in the early 19th century. Uh, but nonetheless, it really, my sense, uh, is that it really doesn't gain steam until the later 19th century. Uh, there's a moment at the end of the Civil War where um, the French had invaded and occupied Mexico. They took advantage of the American Civil War to do so. And um, Secretary of State William Henry Seward, Lincoln Secretary of State, and then, of course, uh, Andrew Johnson's, um, is uh, very clear in contacting uh, the French government that they need to uh, withdraw from Mexico. Um, and there he's citing national security interests in ways that that very much um, parallel the Monroe Doctrine. He doesn't invoke it explicitly, but, but historians have tended to point to that as being a moment where actually the Monroe Doctrine is first being uh, invoked. And it's not till really the end of the, the Civil War. Of course, TR's um, corollary to uh, the Monroe Doctrine would also uh, add a lot of gravitas. So the Monroe Doctrine is, is something that, that 20th century and 21st century US citizens and diplomats and statements are, are very, very familiar with uh, that gain momentum later on. But in this period, uh, manifest destiny is really more of the terminology that we see. And, and a lot of the, the figures that I talk about uh, start pairing these voyages of exploration uh, in, in connection to uh, manifest destiny and not so much the the Monroe Doctrine. You don't see that uh, as much. It does show up arguing against these, like I mentioned with Hain. Yeah. Uh, when Hain is critiquing uh, Reynolds and Adams's uh, proposals for a, a voyage of discovery to the Pacific, uh, that you know, he is summoning the Monroe Doctrine in a sense. He actually doesn't summon it explicitly, but when he's saying the wise and prudent maxims of previous uh, magist chief magistrates, he's talking about both Washington and he's talking about Monroe in that capacity uh, there. But nonetheless, it actually doesn't hold the kind of gravitas in the early 19th century that it's going to in the later 19th century, and certainly not the 20th century. All right, there was a little discussion on our chat about Sims. And someone okay. asked, Lou asked, is Lou Liotti, who's the chairman of our, our committee here, he asked, yeah. is Sims the same naval officer who later commanded the CSS Alabama? and then became a Confederate Admiral during the Civil War. And our trustee, historian mm -hmm. Bill Dudley is also on, and he said, no, he's, you're referring to yeah. Raphael Sims? Yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah. But you know what's interesting is um, John Cleve Sims' son, uh, Junior, the same name, Junior, uh, he shows up later um, where there's uh, these private partner, public, you know, public private partnership, uh, expeditions to the Arctic in the 1850s. Um, the U.S. Navy is partnering with a, a merchant from New York City named Henry Grinnell. And actually, uh, John Cleve Sam's son shows up uh, and requests to be uh, to be joined to the crew of one of these expeditions that he really wants to follow in the footsteps of his father. He wants to attain the Arctic. I don't think he's, he's not a believer in the, the holes in the poles theory, but he wants to realize what his father had, had hoped for. So there's another Sam's that shows up. I, I guess the the inkling that way continued, but no, those, I don't think they're, so it's certainly not the same person. Maybe there's some distant relation there, but I, I, I don't think so. I think they're very different family lineages. Okay, we have a question from Pam Ribby on the chat, and she asked, did any of the U.S. naval expeditions have an unfortunate end, like what happened to the British in Hawaii? Hmm. Um, Well, okay, there there are there's certainly bloodshed in in these. Um and uh what I might do is kind of reverse the 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 perspective of of uh fortune or unfortunate. So, you know, probably the the bloodiest moment in the book and all of these expeditions is a um um a massacre that the US Navy uh, commits against indigenous Fijians in the South Pacific. So the, the Fiji island chain um, was a, a predominant focus for the USXX to be able to map 
uh, and to um, explore, to chart, I should say, uh, and to explore. And, and what I argue in the book is that part of what they're doing is, a big part of what they're doing is cartography, but they're also uh, engaging in diplomacy with indigenous Oceanian societies uh, about uh, allowing U.S. mariners uh, to have access to their waters, to have access to their resources on land like wood and, and fresh water, uh, and also uh, to in, inflict judicial punishment and to act the part of a police force in the South Pacific for any indigenous societies that had done violence against uh, American uh, mariners. And um, they're performing this role, uh, particularly in Fiji, because Fiji is not only uh, has a nexus where it's a it's a very very rich place environmentally. Uh, there's a lot of sperm whales that go there, uh, so therefore it's going to be a place where U.S. whalers are coming. And in fact, Fijians would exchange um, sperm whale teeth as uh, special items of value because they were they were so prevalent down there. So the whaling industry uh, is there. There's also uh, beach de mer or sea cucumber uh, fishery uh, there. Um, which would be for the China market. So there's Salem traders, especially who are going there, who are hiring indigenous Fijians to dive for sea cucumbers out of the corals of these, these beautiful islands. Um, so there's a lot of U.S. commercial interest there, but there's also um, some real profound cultural conflict. So Fijians traditionally uh, would believe that a shipwrecked vessel and its crew were automatic sacrifices to the gods. Uh, and therefore, uh, were were fit for various rituals, uh, including death and and uh, including at least from from Western accounts, cannibalism uh, as well. Um, and this comes to to a head in the case of the XX being in Fiji, uh, where uh, there's some bloodshed that erupts on a beachhead during a no negotiation for pigs and for yams to supply the XX, um, and that results in two U.S. Um, officers. Navy officers are killed on the beach, and then 10 Fijians, I believe it's 10, uh, are killed in this, in this bloodshed. And the commander of the XX, Charles Wilkes, uh, he uh, assembles his men, and um, the following day or the next day, I can't quite remember, but, but very soon afterward, he storms a small island of Malolo, uh, and he lays siege to all of the, the villages, uh, burns them to the ground, and kills, in, in his mind, at least 100 Fijians. Uh, in response. So I think that's unfortunate. Um, I, I, I really, uh, I found my, I was, I'm very critical of Wilkes in the book uh, for, for, uh, for that. So, um, so yes, there's some unfortunate things that happen uh, in these, in these voyages. Yeah. And you write about in your book also that he, he received some, he went on trial when he got back for various he did, yeah, and, and actually, and that, that's an important note that there were voices that were critical of what he had done um, in in the South Pacific, and he is court-martialed for a bunch of different offenses, um, and uh, certainly, where is it here? Hold on. Uh, uh, Nathaniel Philbrook's book *Sea of Glory* is is wonderful for for a, a full account of of this, and particularly thinking about Wilkes as as being um, an Ahab-like figure, uh, a pretty a pretty um, vicious commander. Uh, so he's put on on trial for a number of those uh, of those offenses, and among them is is Malolo, and he's actually uh, acquitted of that, uh, but he's found uh, guilty for for other uh, measures uh, uh, in terms of his treatment of of his sailors. Okay, um, we're getting a lot of questions. So another one is um, Christy Lawrence asked. Uh, well, she says she's interested in your comment on the value of John Kendrick's exploration on the Columbia of the Northwestern Pacific in the late 19th century? Okay, I, I, uh, the, the, late, the late 18th century, I imagine, uh, there uh, for, for, for Kendrick's voyage. Um, yeah, I, I had thought that I'd do a lot more of the Northwest Coast um, because actually the, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's James Monroe who first makes a proposal, uh, a presidential proposal for uh, a public ship to go, and he makes a, it's a very narrow proposal. So I decided I, I wouldn't include it very much, uh, but that the 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 navy ought to do a little bit of surveying for a site of a fort on Astoria, uh, for to support uh, you know the the effort uh, the fur trading American fur trading post at Astoria. So have a fort on the the mouth of the Columbia River, and it would be the U.S. Navy that would do the the surveying, and that would also end up being a navy base as well. So Monroe in 1824. Uh, proposes that 
And then uh, Adams expands on that for the Northwest Coast. And then Reynolds comes in and says, no, 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 we got to do the South Pacific. And Adams fundamentally is a, is an honor hawk. So he cares more about uh, American gentility and honor than about where exactly this ship goes. So he ends up saying, okay, let's do the South Seas. And he, he sides with, with Reynolds. Uh, so I didn't expand on that as much as I I might have. Um, and I might do that in the second book project, since the second book project is more Northern Pacific Rim as opposed to, to Southern Pacific Rim, at least for the, the beginning parts of, of my first book uh, there. So um, nonetheless, people like uh, like Kendrick um, and, and others, uh, Edmund Fanning, uh, these are, are these mariners who really feed into Reynolds's sense of infatuation. Uh, they feed into his fantasies about the South Pacific as a field of fame, as this, this empire of knowledge that, that the U.S. is, is equipped to contribute to. Uh, so he, he's certainly um, among the figures that feeds into this explorationist cause. And he would, would have been among those who had been very supportive uh, of this kind of mission. Thank you for the question. Yeah, and um, again, our trustee, uh, Bill Dudley, he asked, the Lynch expedition to explore and measure everything about the Dead Sea yeah. was a unique one-off expedition, was it not? Do you really assess this as reflecting on a widespread urge to spread Christianity to the near Mideast? Okay, so actually, this is an interesting, great question. Uh, thank you, Bill, for the question. Um, what I argue in the book there's a profound domestic um, element to the book. So the thing is, empire is hard. It costs money, it, case, it, co it costs uh, resources, uh, and it requires a, quite a lot of domestic buy-in. So there's an element of just you know, domestic politics, domestic culture that's really important to shore this up. Um, and so um, missionaries and the effort to establish you know, a... a in some ways, it's somewhat transnational Protestant empire of Christ is uh, both focused on building faith at home and then also dispatching uh, missionaries abroad and spreading uh, Christianity abroad as well. So therefore, what I, I suggest is that a, uh, when one thinks about an empire of religion or an empire of faith, it actually has a, a vertical component, which is the depth of faith of the home society. And then it also has a horizontal component, which is sending missionaries out. Uh, and Lynch's expedition is actually on the vertical side. So what Lynch was really concerned about and what his um, fellow evangelicals were really concerned about uh, was combating um, people like um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, who were really kind of engaging in biblical criticism that the Bible is allegory, it's not literal truth, uh, and that there are truths to the Bible, uh, but you have to be you have to see it as a, a work of human literature in addition to uh, being um, inspired by, by the divine. But you can actually, you should read it at multiple levels um, and not literally. Uh, and evangelicals, and Lynch is a firm evangelical. Uh, he and Edward Robinson, who founds uh, the field of, of modern day biblical archaeology, he's an American who goes to Palestine in the 1830s. Uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to refute the home biblical critics, and also Europe, they're worried about ones in Germany, especially the influences of these very intellectual liberal Christians who have a much more uh, sort of capacious uh, and organic sense of what Christianity entails. They think that's the wrong faith. Uh, they believe the Bible is the literal word of God. And so therefore, what Lynch is trying to do in this case is if he can prove definitively that the Bible and the Old Testament account of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah is actual literal truth, uh, then therefore he can refute these theories that the Bible's not. So it actually, I argue, it has a very domestic uh, audience. And Lynch, Lynch is interesting because he, and in so many, in some ways, he's um, exclusivist. Uh, in other ways, uh, he's he's actually he's very amiable and very cosmopolitan, and he makes these these close connections with uh, Islamic Arab leaders uh, um, for, for Islamic leaders in, in Constantinople, Ottoman Turks, uh, but also people on the ground living around the Dead Sea. He makes these, these uh, cross-cultural alliances. So he's a pretty intriguing figure. But what, what I say to that, um, it's kind of a one-off, but it's also part of a pattern by evangelicals to prove that the Bible's literal truth, including following up on this private expedition 
by Edward Robinson in the 1830s. And he writes a two volume book, I think it's called Biblical Researches. Uh, and it, it's hugely influential and it really shapes Lynch quite a bit. So I hope that answers the question a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we're getting short on time, but I did want to ask um, a question that David Winkler sent in, and it's also interesting to me about your research and the repositories for research material for this era, which were the best ones yeah. and which secondary sources were the most helpful. Great. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the benefits that I had of this is that since these are all government expeditions, there's an incredible voluminous primary source record. Uh, so in, in my case, uh, I was able to rely on congressional uh, records. I was able to rely heavily on records, naval records at the National Archives. I spent a lot of time in that that dark, dimly lit basement of the microfilm reading room that some of you uh, have probably been in as well. Um, so there was there was that, uh, and then there were uh, there were private repositories of letters of public officials. So Princeton University has all of the papers for Samuel Southard, who was Adams's and actually Monroe's Secretary of the Navy, and he's the one that Reynolds wrote all these letters to. So I really got to know Reynolds and read Reynolds's correspondence there in, in Princeton. Um, the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia has the Alicia Kent Kane uh, records. Kane was a key figure in these Arctic expeditions uh, at the end of the book. Uh, so I was able to go there. And then also the fact that these naval officers would come back and they'd replicate European voyagers uh, by publishing narratives of their voyages overseas. So actually Google Books was amazing because I was able just to download all of these narratives, multiple volumes, different you know, uh, editions. Uh, so I relied certainly on that quite a bit. Um, and I had uh, wonderful funding uh, through the Smithsonian. Uh, I had to kind of breeze through that uh, for time purposes, but they have uh, the original volumes of these publications in the basement of the Smithsonian that I was able to use uh, as well. And then in terms of secondary sources, there's, um, you know, I'm, I have to operate on on multiple levels. Um, so on the one hand, there's works that really helped me frame the, the overarching academic argument about American exceptionalism and empire. Um, so Elijah Gould, my mentor, uh, Among the Powers of the Earth, uh, his book really kind of ends actually around the time that I that I that my book takes up uh, in the 18 teens uh, there. So that was that his book was was enormously influential as, as was his, his mentorship. Um, in terms of thinking about the scope, I I love uh, British imperial historians, especially Linda Colley, I'm, I'm a big fan of. And so her her work thinking about the global dimensions of the British Empire, cultural dynamics, cultural encounters, uh, and also um, the importance of domestic imperial politics are really important uh, for me. Uh, and then I, I had the benefit of uh, people like Phil Brick or uh, Vincent Ponco Jr. wrote a, a book, kind of a, basically my topic, um, from 1973, but his was was much more focused on just getting all the facts down about uh, these exhibitions. It wasn't quite as analytical. It wasn't quite as much as making an academic argument or trying to trying to tie them all together or explain them as a phenomenon. But normal, nonetheless, I'm deeply indebted uh, to uh, to Panko for that. Uh, so there are a lot of various resources. There's a lot of other colleagues: Dane Morrison, uh, Brian Rouleau, uh, Emily Conroy Crutz. Uh, all of these are people who are thinking about global empire, global encounters in the early republic, um, and who were, were also very influential. So thank you. Great. Um, maybe you could just tell us real quick about what you're working on now. I know you're working on another book before we close. Just Sure. Great. Sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so for the, the next book project, uh, I'm actually going back to some of my dissertation research. I had a, uh, there's a big expedition to uh, Japan and to chart the, really the whole North Pacific Rim called the North Pacific Exploring Expedition. And that uh, traversed the globe, I think, between 1853 and 1856. Uh, and it was huge. It was five ships. It was over 500 men and officers. It was actually the largest voyage of discovery ever dispatched by any Western power in the age of sail was, the, was this expedition. Uh, and there's virtually nothing written about it, uh, in large measure because there was never a published narrative because the Civil War intervened. Um, and nonetheless, it, it engaged uh, very heavily in the work that Perry 
had sought to do with going to Japan in the 1850s. So they, they, they arrive in Japan, this big expedition that arrives in Japan right after Perry, and they start charting the entire coastline of Japan. And they're also very consciously trying to push the limits of the Treaty of Kanagawa that Perry signed, kind of a gunpoint, uh, in Japan. Um, so what that means for us is that Perry is, and Perry, the Perry mission is one of the big moments for at least antebellum naval history. But in my view, the story isn't complete because there's this other big expedition that follows closely on the heels of it, and we haven't heard the full story. So my uh, current work is, is to uh, research and write eventually what I hope to be a joint analysis that contextualized Perry uh, in light of this larger expedition that, that followed it, uh, but also other expeditions, the Russians and the British as well. So also getting into more of that global framework. Uh, I'm also trying to learn Japanese right now. Uh, and and please wish me luck, pray for me at night, you know, uh, et cetera, for me to, to, to master the language to be able to use Japanese sources.